the Open Advocacy of VPRI Research Excellence Speaker Series. Uh, my name is Josh Levin Ryan, a research services officer uh, in the OVPRI at UTSC. And here is my colleague from the OVPRI, Jason Darby. Well, we want to ensure that everyone has the opportunity to participate today and can receive all that is presented. Um, should you need to turn on live captions, please go to your meeting controls uh, under more actions and you can turn on or off live captioning. I turn my video off now just to ensure everyone has a, a good connection. Uh, just some some housekeeping. So uh, a reminder that this webinar is being recorded. Uh, to please mute your audio and turn off your video to accommodate those who do not have enough bandwidth. Um, we'll be hosting a recording on the UTSC Research uh, YouTube channel as well as the OBPRI website at a future date. Into the chat box at the end of the day. As well as send out to everybody that attends. And the participants, please hold please till the end of the talk. And if you do have questions, to them into the chat box. And so with that, to hand things over to Professor Irina Creed. Thank you, Joshua, and good morning, everyone. Before we begin, I wish to acknowledge the land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. The Celebration of Research Excellence le Lecture Series is sponsored by the OVPRI and celebrates those who have won awards from our office, the Principal's Research Award, recipients of Canada Research Chairs and the Royal Society. Today, we are celebrating Professor Stefanos Aritakis, who is the winner of the 2021 UTSC Pre-Tenure Faculty Research Award in the Sciences Division. Stefanos is an accomplished assistant professor in the Department of Computer and Mathematical Sciences at U of T Scarborough. His research interests include resolving certain fundamental mathematical questions pertaining to general relativity. As a graduate student, Stefanos became famous for his single author discovery of the now coined term, the Eritakis instability, which mathematically proved the instability of extreme black holes. This influential work is currently being studied by physicists and astronomers around the world. In 2015, Stefanos published a book called The Dynamics of External Black Holes. He continues to publish extensively in the top mathematical and physics journals and has delivered almost 100 invited lectures around the world. His important research has been recognized with several esteemed awards, including a Sloan Fellowship, Ontario Early Research Award, and more recently, the 2021 International Union of Pure and Applied Physics Young Scientist Prize in Mathematical Physics. His contributions and achievements as an early career researcher are remarkable, and we are honored to recognize and celebrate his achievements today. Stefanos, thank you for joining us and sharing your work with us. Over to you. Thank you very much for, for everything, for the chance to give this talk and for your introduction. Um, I've already been a member of the UTC community for six years now. And these uh, past six years have been wonderful for me, both uh, academically and also uh, personally. I've been able, like the community and the environment that uh, the department has been so wonderful that um, allowed me to grow uh, my family and grow my research and be happy. So it's, uh, uh, it exceeded my expectations, to be honest. Uh, Okay, thank you very much again. Um, so, my research uh, focuses um, on the mathematics of general relativity and specifically on studying the dynamics of black holes uh, from a purely mathematical point of view. Now, uh, I have always been interested in physics, in understanding our nature. Of, Right. So uh, when I try to solve a problem, first I want to make sure that this problem um, 
is legitimate from a mathematical point of view, but also that uh, after solving this problem, we will be able to say something about uh, the nature. So I don't, don't just want to prove something abstractly um, for the sake of mathematics, but at the end I would also like to say something interesting to physicists, astrophysicists, uh, etc., astronomers. Uh, so, in today's talk, I will try to first give you an introduction as to what our setting is, which is that of general relativity. And then at the end, I will try to explain to you what uh, more specifically my research interests uh, are. Um, okay, so now general relativity. Um, Um, is one of the greatest examples of human intelligence. Uh, it's a theory founded by Einstein in 1915, okay? And it's a theory that studies gravity. So it's all about understanding gravity, which is one of the fundamental forces of nature. Um, and the theory of Einstein approximates, approximates Newton's theory um, in the simple situations. But in more complicated situations, the, these two theories uh, diverge. Newton's theory is the theory of gravity that we are taught in high school. Uh, but Einstein's theory of uh, gravity is something way more complicated to describe. And in fact, if someone wants to understand it correctly, and yeah, correctly, then uh, one needs first to have finished a graduate course uh, in pure mathematics, and specifically in geometry and partial differential questions. And only then we can be um, properly introduced to that theory. So it's certainly not something that um, anyone can, like a high school student or a first year student in math or physics, you know, can uh, understand. Now, the predictions of that theory are of great importance for our natural world and specifically for the structure of the universe. Right? Um, the nice thing about relativity is that it, um, people, from, people from various disciplines co collaborate uh, with the aim of advancing our knowledge of our universe. And as I said before, like mathematicians, physicists, astrophysicists, astronomers, engineers, etc., work in that area. Um, now, as a mathematical theory, general relativity is very beautiful, um, but also complex. And it combines, as I said, geometry analysis and also physics. And one of the most important predictions of the theory is uh, black holes, okay, which captures the, the imaginations of, of scientists and, and not only. Now, very quickly, I, I have no plan to show you equations, and the only reason I might have some equations is just so that you can see them, but I, we're not going to spend any time uh, studying uh, equations or any technicalities, most of the time we will just be describing pictures. But, um, um, okay, so what I would like to start is to just remind you the Newtonian theory of gravity that, as I said, we we're taught already in high school. And then I would like to show you the contrast of that theory with the general theory of relativity, so that you can see the huge um, uh, gap between the two theories. <clears throat> in their description. Okay, so in Newtonian theory, we have that any body uh, that moves inside the gravitational field that is generated by an object that has some mass, um, the position of that object, uh, of that particle, uh, is given by this equation here. So this is the position, this is the second derivative of the position, so in other words, this is the acceleration. So in Newton's theory, we prescribe the acceleration of any object um, as long as that object is inside the gravitational field. And what does it mean that we to prescribe the acceleration? It basically means that actually, why do we prescribe the acceleration? We prescribe the acceleration because in Newtonian theory, uh, we assume that gravity is a force. Uh, we have a formula for the force, and then the force is related to the acceleration via Newton's third law. So these two equations, like the, the, um, the equation for the force, for the gravitational force, and then the relation of the force with the acceleration, is what, you know, completely uh, describes Newtonian theory of gravity. 
you have the bodies, you have the masses, you have their distances, you have the forces acting on them, the forces give you the accelerations, the accelerations give you the velocities, the velocities give you the position, you have the position at every time, that's it done, you know your system and its evolution. So this is very easy and so this is very easy to describe in some sense and it's already easy for high school students precisely because the whole theory is based on the notion of force. Okay, we prescribe the force and then the force gives us the motion of the objects. Uh, the, if we have two bodies, only two bodies interacting with each other gravitationally, then the orbits that um, these two or, uh, or bodies can follow are conical sections, okay? Like circle, ellipse, parabola, hyperbola. This is, these are the solutions of these two equations to provide precisely these curves, these trajectories for the objects to move. And that's why we have uh, the gravity, uh, Newton's theory already is, gives us a good approximation to what we see in our solar system, right? Where the planets move on ellipses, the co comets move on parabolas or hyperbolas, etc. Okay, so that was all about Newtonian theory. What about the general theory of relativity? So the slide that described uh, Newtonian gravity is now replaced by this slide to describe the Einstein's theory of relativity. So you already see here way more complicated questions, way more complicated expressions, way more complicated things. This is the um, analog of the force equation for Newton's gravity, this whole thing, super complicated. And once you solve this, then you have to solve this thing in order to determine the acceleration and then finally the position of an object. So what I will try to do is I will just try to give you an insight as to what these things possibly mean so that you get an idea what the Einstein questions are and yeah, the, the theory is about. And then we will just say a few more things about black holes. All right. So let's see what these things mean. <clears throat> Before I, we talk about um, the theory itself, I need to introduce to you a little bit of geometry, um, which is, as I said, what is properly done in a graduate course okay, in geometry. So what is even more complicated in the case of relativity is that the geometry that we deal with is not spatial geometry. It's not geometry that, you know, uh, allows us to study the distance between two objects because the, ge the geometry that we need to use in relativity is the geometry of space-time. So it's geometry that incorporates distances but also time. Okay, let's see. So the geometry in general is what we call an inner product in mathematics. Um, what do we mean by an inner product? Basically, we mean that at every point we can compute the length of a vector and at every point we can compute the angle of two vectors. That's what geometry is, okay? So at every point you have directions along which we can move and we are able to measure uh, lengths of these directions and also angles. That's the foundations of geometry. Um, now, uh, what is a geodesic? A geodesic is a curve that somehow generalizes a straight line of the plane. So a, a geodesic in general um, is a curve that uh, has a property that is tangential vector. Okay, every curve has a tangential vector. Um, it, and that tangential vector is spirally transported along itself. So in other words, um, we are on a space that admits geometry. That is to say, at every point, we know everything about directions, lengths, and angles. And what we want is curves for which the um, tangential vector, in some sense, does not change direction. So in more simple terms, um, geodesic curves are curves that have no acceleration. Okay, if you move along these curves, then you don't feel any acceleration. And that's exactly what happens in the case of the plane. That's exactly what happens on straight lines. If we move on straight lines, we don't feel any acceleration. So this is the notion of geodesics. And the geodesics will be very important um, um, 
part of uh, you know geometry. Okay, um, so let's see a few examples of geodesics. Um, we have a sphere here, and every great circle like that are geodesics of the sphere. Okay, in the same way that these are uh, geodesics on the line on the on the plane. These circles here are geodesics on the on the sphere. So if we move on the sphere along these curves, then we are not going to feel any acceleration um, relative to the sphere. Okay. If if our universe is just the sphere, then we don't feel any acceleration. Now, very strange things can happen um, about these geodesics um, if they are not on straight or if they are not on the plane. Uh, if they're not straight lines on the plane. So if we still um, um, consider the sphere and the geodesics of it, then what we can do, we can take a straight line, sorry, we can take a geodesic here, right, which is a circle, so it's a geodesic, and then we can take two other geodesics here, which is orthogonal to this one here. So since these two geodesics are orthogonal to that one, these two geodesics are considered to be parallel, here at least. Right? They, 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 they both move orthogonally to the same line, so they are parallel. But eventually, these two parallel lines intersect. Okay, so you have intersection of initially parallel lines on a uh, sphere. Whereas if you have parallel lines on the plane at some point, then they will stay parallel forever right? on the on the plane. So. Um, the geodesics, in some sense, uh, generalize straight lines for more general geometrical spaces, but not all properties uh, survive. Okay, so you have initially parallel geodesics that intersect. What else do we have? We can have a triangle that has three right angles, which would be completely impossible in on the plane. Um, we can have uh, geodesics that. Um, if, if you perturb a little bit the sphere and you just consider something like an egg, which I call it an ellipsoid, then you can have a geodesic um, covering this thing, like going uh, just a single line going around the, the egg many times. And you can have even this. This is just one line going around many, many times. And again, this line from the point of view of the egg is the same thing as a straight line from the point of view of the plane. Okay, It's a straight line. Uh, another geodesic covering a whole portion of the egg. Now, these are geodesics on the cone. Okay, these are the geodesics that, along with, you know, you wouldn't feel an acceleration if you were to move on the cone. And what do you have? Now you have, this is one geodesic, okay, goes around the cone and then comes back like that. And the interesting thing is that this geodesic intersects itself, okay? And not only intersects itself, but intersects itself orthogonally. So that would be impossible again on the plane, right? To have one straight line intersecting itself orthogonally. But lines, like curves that play the role of straight lines on more complicated geometries, such as here, um, have this property. Now we can consider the donut, the torus, and these are examples of geodesics on such surfaces. Um, and also the red and the green things are also geodesics, but these black things are not. So every blue is a geodesic. Where I, um, so everything that cut the donut like that is a geodesic, but uh, if you consider the horizontal things, only the outer and the inner thing is a geodesic. If you try to perturb a little bit this geodesic, then, and so if you, if you try to find another geodesic nearby the green one, then you're gonna get something like that. What does that mean? That means that we had the original green, the geodesic, we perturbed it a little bit, and then finally we get something that goes far away from the original green. Okay, so here we had two lines starting very close to each other, the green stayed in the inner circle, and the blue one did, did the whole uh, revolution around the torus. Okay, so you have instability of geodesics, as we say. Anyway, this is just some properties of geodesics to keep in mind. Here, another geodesic going around the donut several times. Okay, that was the basic introduction in general geometry, okay? 
Now I would like to specify a little bit more all this discussion in the setting that uh, we would be interested in, namely in space-time geometries, okay, which is what we use in relativity. So first of all, what is our space? Like before, I showed you several examples. I showed you the, I showed you the example of a plane, of a sphere, of an egg, of a donut, of a cone. Okay, what is the actual space we're going to use? Well, all the previous examples that I showed you are two dimensional. Okay, like if you move on these surfaces, then you have only two dimensions to consider. Uh, the space that we will study, all the spaces that this we study, are four dimensional. Okay, and this has to do with the fact that we assume that we have three spatial dimensions and one temporal dimension, and we incorporate all of them into one object that we call the universe or the space-time, okay? That is a four-dimensional object. Um, and that object, like that space, consists every point of it is just an event. So the space-time is simply the set of all events from the infinite past to the infinite future. Okay, all the events is our space. And that space formally forms a four-dimensional space. space yeah. Um, now, uh, on that space, we will uh, introduce a geometry, and that geometry will allow us to measure lengths and angles of directions, as we said before. Now, the only strange thing is that this geometry is a little bit uh, more complicated in the sense that, okay, it has to provide lengths and angles of all directions, but at the same time, it will have to distinguish in some sense between space and time. So we should be able to define what space is and what time is purely geometrically. Okay, so spatial coordinates and time coordinates should be, should, we should be able to understand them purely geometrically. All right, in any case, this can be done. Okay, I cannot, of course, provide all the details, but I'm just telling you that uh, the space-time geometry, we have a space-time geometry that allow us to, to do this. I'm going to show you some details, it's just that I cannot tell you everything. The important thing is that at the end of the day, we can have a geometry on our set of events, on our universe, that has the following property that allow us to define the following, to define that, to say that every observer has their own clock and every observer has their own measure. So we have a geometry that provides to every observer, whatever that means, um, with a clock, with their own characteristic clock and their own characteristic measure. That immediately says that, you know, um, geometry, you know, provides to everyone a time and, um, and, and, and distances, okay, provides times and distances, but um, this is done in such a way so that every person, um, every observer um, um, uh, has their own uh, clock and measure. Okay, so these are very relative. Has the, every observer understands their own time and their own space. Okay, so time and space is super relative. Okay, time and space, like how, what is the distance of two objects? and what is the time that has passed between two events. If you want to measure these things, you can, but every observer will do it in their own way and they will find a different answer. Okay, so there is a notion of time, there is a notion of space that they're all relative to the observer. Um, now, now, what is super interesting is, and that's why it's called the theory of relativity, okay? But what is very interesting that is that out of these super relative things, the time and space, one extracts something that is absolutely absolute, okay, which is the speed of light. So the speed of light is independent of the observer that measures it. So every clock and every measure of every observer are harmonically um, um, synced. Okay, in such a way, so they don't agree, but they um, uh, are, are such that they, when they try to measure the speed of light, like how much time passed and what is the distance that the, the light uh, traveled in a specific time interval, um, if, if every observer tries to uh, 
um, measure the speed of light, then they will all find the same answer. OK, so this line tells us that the theory is relative, but this line tells us that the theory is super absolute, depending on what you know, concepts you are looking at. So that was one of the big leaps of Einstein, namely he was willing to drop uh, our everyday perception of the absoluteness of space and of time so that he can uh, assume that the speed of light is in fact independent of the observer. Okay, no matter how we move relative to time, like we might not move, I might not move, someone else might move relative to time, like everyone measures the same speed for light. All right. Um, this diagram here just shows the um, relative of, of space on, and time. But I don't have time to explain what exactly it is. Now, uh, let me say a few more words, slightly more technical about these space-time geometries. As I said, the, the main goal of space-time geometry is precisely to have those two postulates satisfied. Now, how can we do this? Well, uh, we need our geometry to at least separate between what is space and what is time. Measuring space is relative. Measuring time is relative. But at least we should have a way to separate between the notion of space and time. Okay, Measuring them is relative, but at least knowing what is time and what is space should be relative. Uh, should, not, should not be relative. So indeed, at every point, we have a collection of directions, these are directions, okay, which point towards space. In other words, there is no time difference between such events. Okay, if you consider such directions, these directions are called space-like. Okay, so uh, among all directions, there are some of them that point in the direction of space. A few other directions point in the direction of time. That is to say, um, there is time distance between this event here and that event here. Time distance between that event here and that event here. Now, if you try to measure the time between here and here, you need to specify which observer measures that uh, time. Okay, But there is a, a time difference between these two events. Okay because that event is obtained by this event by following a, such a direction, which we call time-like direction. And this direction is given by the geometry. Okay, so what is the difference? Uh, how does the geometry differentiate between the directions of point in the direction of space and uh, the directions of point in the direction of time? Well, it's simply that here, uh, which says that the, somehow the length of these directions have to be positive and then the point direction of space, whereas the length of these directions is negative, and therefore they point in the direction of time. OK. OK, so at this geometry in such a way allows us to separate between what we mean by time and what we mean by space. And now there are the events somewhere here in the middle between the the temporal directions and the space-like directions, okay? Which are what? These are the events uh, that only light can experience, okay? So these are the directions which are called light-like, okay? And these, are, these correspond to the trajectory of light. So if a photon moves like that in this direction, if you travel slower than the speed of, speed of uh, light, like us, okay? then we move simply in the direction of time. So we follow these directions. And if someone tried to move faster than the speed of light, which is impossible, um, then that someone would, know, would follow space. OK, so that would correspond to purely special um, movement, motion, and that would be like that. So concluding, the space-time geometry has the property that at every point we have a trichotomy of vectors. OK? And like three categories, we have the vectors, the directions that point in uh, the direction of time, we have the directions that point in the direction of space, and we have the vectors that point in the direction of the motion of light. Okay, and these vectors have different properties. 
Okay, now the if you only consider this uh, surface where the um, light moves, this surface is called the light cone. Okay, and it's exactly what separates time from space. It's this light cone. Now, the, the only thing that we want to do in relativity is to determine at every point what is the light cone. So at every point, we want to know its light cone because then we know the directions of time and also we know the directions of space. And based uh, from this, you know, we can, uh, based on this, we can uh, determine everything we want. We can determine the evolution of everything. Now, you might remember that uh, we had the case of the flat of the plane and we had also the case of the sphere. The plane is what we call flat. Parallel lines stay parallel, whereas the sphere is curved, um, um, which means that parallel lines intersect due to the curvature. Now, how can we make sense of flat and curved spacetime geometries? Well, that's very easy. Instead of looking at lines or geodesic lines, we look at the light cones. In the flat space-time, or also known as Lorentzian geometries, we have that the light cones are basically parallel to each other. You see this is parallel to this, parallel to this. At every point, the light cones are parallel. In the flat case. In the curved case, however, the light cones are not parallel. So this is a curved space-time geometry. At every point, the light cone um, changes compared to the light cone at a nearby point. So here you see this one uh, turns, it gets even bigger, and uh, this one gets smaller, this gets bigger, this one also turns. So certainly this is not parallel to this and so on. So this is indication of curvature of space-time. So that's how we recognize that the space-time is curved. Okay, if this null cones, um, um, which, as I said again, they they are what separate time from space. Okay, and moreover, they provide the trajectories of light. Um, if these narcons are not um, parallel, which once again corresponds to what I showed to you before, that in the flat case lines stay parallel forever, whereas in the curved case, in the curved case, straight lines um, intersect eventually, or could even diverge. OK, so that's what defines curvature of space-time geometries. And now we can finally talk about uh, what the heart of uh, relativity, which is the Einstein equations. So every theory in physics is governed by equations. Each equation tells you how a system evolves, how a system behaves. You solve that equation and then you understand the system. So the Einstein equations give us how a system behaves. Right? Well, system, a gravitational system, because we study gravity. So let's see how this is done. OK, so the first postulate of the theory is that as soon as we have a mass, then that mass curves the space-time geometry. What does that mean? It means that if you have no objects, nothing whatsoever, then likely your geometry of the space-time, look, it, it looks like that. Then as soon as you introduce a massive object, say the Earth, us, anything, as soon as you introduce a massive object, then suddenly you're introducing curvature, which means this. Okay. And that curvature can also be represented as curving the space-time fabric, as we say. But in true reality, it means that you are changing the light cones. OK, so you see here we have curvature of space-time because the Earth is here, and also some curvature here of space-time because the Moon is here. All right, that's the first postulate of relativity. Now, what else? Um, now, what I just said, Einstein equations may turn this into an equation. OK, so the Einstein equations precisely tell you what is the curvature of the space-time given uh, the mass that you have incorporated. OK, so the Einstein equations turn this thing here into specific equations, and that's exactly what is done. OK, so they tell you what is the curvature, uh, depending on what kind of object you have in space time. And now these equations are differential equations, complicated, blah, blah. 
but uh, do I say here? Yeah. But uh, the important thing is that the, at the end of the day, they only uh, depend on the notion of conservation of energy. Okay. So it's really a miracle how Einstein came up with this procedure that uh, you know allowed him to understand what the curvature should be depending on what the space time is, or what depending on what the object is. So you see already the difference between the two theories. In the theory of, uh, I mean, between the Einstein theory and the Newton theory. In Newton's theory, we have Earth, we just measure its mass, and then we can immediately derive the force that acts on any other object due to the existence of the Earth. Okay, so gravity is just a force. You compute that force, you're done. You can compute everything else. Here, gravity is not, is not in, um, interpreted as force. It's interpreted as curvature of the space-time geometry. That's all. That's gravity. Okay, not force. Curvature of the space-time geometry. Now, how do, how how do we how is how is the space-time curved? Well, it's curved according to the Einstein equations. All right. Now the, um, we have the Earth. Say we have the Moon. Okay, the space-time is curved. All right, good. But then how do we understand the actual orbits of the objects? We understand how the space-time geometry is scaled. That's fine. But then how uh, does the moon move around the Earth? How do you compute that? And here comes the second postulate of the theory that says that um, objects that move only due to their gravitational force, say not due to a rocket or you know, another engine or anything else. So if they only if they only experience gravity, which is what we call freely falling objects, um, these objects move on geodesics of the space-time geometry. Okay. So you remember that if uh, the geometry is curved, then the geodesics, such as in the case of the sphere, for example, they are circles. They don't have to be straight lines. And this is exactly what happens in this case. The Earth curves the space-time according to the Einstein equations. And then we have a, spa a curved space-time geometry that has curved geodesics. And one of them is precisely this curve. And that's exactly the curves, the curve along which the moon uh, moves. So this is what the theory does. It, it asks you, what kind of objects do you have? You say, I have this object and this object. Then, OK, then the theory tells you how the space-time is curved. And then once you have computed how the space-time is curved, then you have to compute the geodesics. And then the geodesics provide the evolution of your system. Now, many applications uh, of uh, this theory. For example, um, light also moves on geodesics, which are called null geodesics. Okay. Uh, but uh, again, uh, light suffers from the same effect, that the geodesics are curved because of the curvature of space-time. So here, the space-time is not curved, but as soon as um, you approach the sun, the space-time gets curved. So the geodesic also bends, and so the trajectory of light might look like that. So when we observe um, a star from the Earth, then it might appear to us that the sun is here on the night sphere, but uh, in reality it was here. Okay. And that effect has been uh, measured. Um, so that's also which basically provides a confirmation of the theory. Now other applications of relativity are in GPS, um, in corrections of the um, trajectories of the planets, uh, in the existence of gravitational waves, black holes, etc. So now let me say a few things about gravitational waves before I talk about black holes. Um, as I said, if you have one object in your space-time, then this space-time is curved. If you have two objects, then both of these objects curve the space-time. But then what happens if those two objects move relative to each other? So let's say they, they just um, um, orbit each other. OK, they do something like that. Then that means that at every moment, um, they, they change position in space-time. And since they change position in space-time, that means that they, they, they change the region of the space-time that they, they bend, they curve the most. 
So motion of objects corresponds to changes of the space-time geometry and, and changes of the curvature of the space-time, right? Because the object is here, it, it, then it's a lot curved here, but when it moves here, then it's a lot curved here and so on. So that motion corresponds to changes of the curvature. Um, <clears throat> that change of the curvature, which basically you can think of it as an oscillation of the curvature. So whatever you see here, that change of the curvature is what we call a gravitational wave. And such waves do carry energy. So if you consider everything we said before, plus motion of objects, that, that, that thing from creates such a change of the curvature, and that's what we call a gravitational wave. Now, um, Yeah, so the Nobel, uh, the physics Nobel of 1993 was awarded for uh, detecting gravitational waves. OK, so for detecting these things. Uh, and that was the reason the Nobel was awarded. Um, what was the system that was creating these, th these gravitational waves that were detected by us? It was a system of uh, of neutron stars. So it was a system of stars. Okay, there were there was a system of two stars, very dense stars that were orbiting each other and they were uh, creating gravitational waves. And uh, the um, astronomers observed that system and they were able to measure things and indeed uh, um, uh, detect these uh, ripples here, these gravitational waves. So that's what was done in 74, and um, they were awarded the prize in 93. Now, much later in 2016, something very similar was observed, but in the case where these two objects were not stars, but they were black holes. Okay. And for the same, for, for that work where, the, where these two things are black holes, um, the that work was awarded the 2016 Nobel Prize. Uh, now, what is a black hole? <clears throat> so, this picture represents a black hole. If I had shown you that picture at the beginning of the lecture, most likely you wouldn't be able to understand what it is. But hopefully now, you should be completely able to understand what it is. So, uh, this region here, so this region here, is precisely the black hole region. Let's see why. Black hole region basically means, first of all, that once you enter that region, you cannot exit it. Nothing. Not, uh, we cannot exit that region. Light itself cannot exit that region. So if we look towards that region, we won't be able to observe anything from that because nothing escapes that region. So nothing can come to us. So when we don't receive anything from something, then our brain sees black, right? So if we look towards a black hole, all we will just see black because nothing comes to us from that region. So that's why it's called black hole. OK, so the thing of black hole is that everything is trapped inside it, even lights itself. Now, how can, how can you see that indeed this is what's happening here? Well, these are exactly the light cones, um, uh, which precisely give us the direction of time, right? We can only move towards the, in the direction of time. We cannot move in the direction of space. We can only move in the direction of time. And light itself can only move in these directions. Now, if you are away from the black hole, everything is OK. Like the null cones are parallel. The geometry is almost flat. Everything is good. But as we approach the black hole, you can see that these light cones bend, turn. And actually, they tend towards the center of the black hole. And at some point, they have turned so much, for example, here, that once you are here, you are necessarily forced to enter the black hole. And in fact, you cannot even exit it. So if the null cone was like that, then we would be able to exit it. But the null cone has turned so much that, you know, all possible directions point towards the inside the black hole. So time itself points only towards the interior of the black hole and never towards the exterior. And that's why anything that moves a long time, you know, um, if you follow time, then you must necessarily stay inside the black hole. 
So that turning of the of the um, Nalcons corresponds to curvature, and that curvature has been created because we have a lot of gravity. Or in other words, we have a very, very massive object, a very dense object that has created so much curvature due to the Einstein questions that these Nalcons have turned so much that they only point towards the interior of it, so nothing can escape. So these are regions where gravity is super, super strong. So we have a lot of curvature, so we have a lot of bending of the Nalcons. So have trapping of any observer towards the interior of that region. Another representation um, in terms of the space-time fabric, where you see these things have curved so much that nothing can go back up. Another representation of the black hole. Wait, the boundary of the black hole, this region here is called the event horizon. Now, another interesting thing is that um, if you are outside the black hole, then uh, light can orbit the black hole in the same way that the moon orbits Earth. In the case of a black hole, it is possible that light itself orbits it. So you have light, light geodesics. You have geodesics in the direction of light that go around the black hole. Okay? So if you are here, you can see your back. If you think about it. Okay, that's an interesting result about black holes. Um, now, I want just for fun to spend one minute to show you uh, what the equations look like. Okay, well, like what kind of equations do we deal with in order to study the geometry of black holes, specifically black holes? I, of course, don't have time or, you know, I cannot give you any technicalities, but what I can try to do is I can show you another system where the mathematics are very similar, okay? So instead of showing you mathematics of black holes, I'm going to show you another system, the mathematics of which are similar. So I'm, at the end of the day, I'm not going to show you any mathematics. I'm just going to show you another system that is similar to... Uh, this one here, okay? They, they require similar mathematics. And that is ba just balloons. So, for example, let's consider the following uh, question. Consider a balloon, two balloons that are of identical material, and you inflate the first one, say, 70-80%, and we inflate the other one 30%. And we connect them with a straw, and we let the air flow freely between these two balloons. And the question is then, as soon as you let the air flow from um, between the two balloons, how will uh, the air flow? Which, like, will it go from here to here? Will it go from here to here? Will the two balloons try to reach equal size? What's going to happen? So that, like, answering this question requires to understand some mathematics, which, again, are very similar to the mathematics that are needed to understand black holes. That's why I'm mentioning this. So the answer to this question is a bit surprising. Uh, what will happen is that um, the smaller balloon will get even smaller, actually will collapse, and the big balloon will expand. OK, so the small balloon will lose all its air, all its air, and all the air will be pushed inside the big one. So the small one beats the big one. OK, whereas intuitively one would think that um, they would reach equal size. So the, the bigger one would get smaller and the smaller would get bigger, but that's not what happens. Okay. This, this gets bigger and this gets smaller. And actually, exactly the same thing happens with bubbles. So you want to study bubbles. Again, you need to use the same mathematics as in black holes. And here you can see actually this phenomenon. You have a small bubble merged with a big one, and you can see that the small bubble is protruding inside the big one. So the small one is beating the big one and not the big one, the small one. Okay, so you see this one goes towards inside of the big one. So the small one beats somehow the big one, which is exactly what happens here. This one, the air will move towards the big one. Anyway, that was just for fun. Um, that's what I said before, um, that um, uh, we have the first direct detection of black holes and gravitational waves coming from black holes in 2016. And this is my final slide where I would like to explain uh, my work. So 
we want to understand the characteristic properties of black holes. Now, uh, probably as it's the case with uh, human beings, if you want to understand the character of a person, then what we should do is to uh, put that person into some test, okay, or allow that person to interact with something. And out of that interaction, we can uh, understand a little bit more about the character of that person. So that's exactly the same thing that we're doing with black holes. We consider black holes and then we allow these black holes to interact with objects. And we see how these black holes um, behave under this interaction. Uh, and based on that behavior, we understand properties of the black holes themselves. One of um, these properties that we want to understand and um, that comes out of interactions is the stability properties. So we want to understand that um, we want to understand if or we want to investigate if um, black holes uh, after interacting with something, whatever that might be, uh, if they return to a state that is very similar to the one they had before the interaction, or if black holes completely change their character after their interaction, so they turn into something else with different characteristics. What does it mean to have different characteristics? It, well, it could mean that they rotate faster, it could mean that they become bigger, they become smaller, they get more charged, like there are various quantities that characterize the character of the black hole. And we want to see how these quantities change um, upon uh, um, um, interactions of the black hole with other things. All right, so what happens is that um, in my case, I have studied a special category of black holes, which are known as extremal black holes. And these black holes are the ones that are originally rotating very fast, okay, super fast. So almost maximally rotating black holes, very fast rotating things. And what I have found is that in this case, they do have an, um, a stable character. Okay, they, have a, they suffer from an instability. That is to say, you can impose a very specific and very small interaction um, to that, those black holes. And these black holes will, um, although this interaction is very small at the beginning, um, the nature of the black hole is such that this interaction will in fact grow, okay? And that growth will uh, turn the black hole into something um, different compared to what it was originally. So, okay, so that's what the theory is. And now here is the plot a little bit more specifically. The, um, the blue thing basically tells you um, the interaction. So. You, um, it plots the interaction, the red thing plots the first derivative of the interaction, and the green thing plots the second derivative of the interaction. Okay, and, um, and the instability was observed, like what I found, is that the instability is found at the level of the second derivative here. Everything, um, so originally the interaction is small, but then will go to zero, which is a sign of stability. But if you look more carefully at other quantities related to the interaction, namely their derivatives, which basically means the velocity and the acceleration of the interaction of the perturbation, then those objects, like the velocity and the acceleration, will grow. Okay, so if an object, a quantity of the acceleration of the um, of the interaction of the perturbation of the black hole grows, that means that the perturbation itself will become something different, so it's unstable, it's an unstable state. Uh, now the instability, this stability was first found um, pu purely mathematically, right, with equations, but um, since then has been studied, uh, you know, by physicists and astrophysicists in various settings for various uh, other kinds of uh, objects. Okay. Um, That is actually my last slide. So uh, allow me to conclude by saying that um, hopefully I convince you that general relativity is a theory of uh, great uh, beauty and complexity. Um, it's a mathematical, it's a physics, it's a scientific theory um, that allows us, you know, to advance our knowledge and understand, you know, very interesting phenomena of our universe. Um, uh, as a scientific theory, it uh, combines many disciplines. And as I just said, it has uh, fundamental applications. 
And most importantly, it's a prime example of the greatness of the human thought. So allow me to conclude by saying also, by repeating what Einstein said, that life is like riding a bicycle. To keep your balance, you must keep moving. And allow me to add to this that we must keep moving forward, but because only then the balance, um, the equilibrium of the bicycle is stable. Even though in some cases, some instability is good. Okay, thank you very much. Well, Stefano, well, thank, thank you for showing that the theory of general relativity is indeed beautiful. And it's interesting to think that scientists have been positing the existence of black holes for over a century, and that it was only in 2019 that we had the first image ever recorded of a black hole, which must, uh, must have been celebrated around the world. Yes. Uh, I have uh, a couple quick questions. Unfortunately, we only have a couple minutes, but I wanted to ask um, maybe one of them. Your Eratakis instability proved the instability of extreme uh, black holes. Does Earth, and I mean, we're approaching Earth Day soon, does Earth benefit from black holes and or their instabilities? Um, so I don't know if we can find a very everyday practical application of um, black holes on air, like about life on Earth. But um, I mean, studying black holes, um, you know, tells us a lot about the nature of gravity. And if we understand gravity, we can probably one day, you know, find a machine that cancels gravity. And if you can do that, then, you know, uh, the energy problem is solved, the transportation problem is solved, everything on the planet is solved. Uh, because gravity is the main um, uh, obstruction to everything we do every day. Um, now, black holes, inside the black holes, things are very strange. Um, you can lose um, the kind of, you, like, you, the, the physics as we know it does not apply uh, inside black holes. So, um, we need to develop other kind of theories. So, more research is needed to understand what's happening inside black holes. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it provides a lot of food for, for thought. So different roles inside of black holes. I was just wondering, and I know we only have a couple minutes, but if, if you shift with the instability, if a black hole shifts from being stable to unstable, um, does it become shift from being a sink, meaning everything going into it to a source and everything being released again? What happens to uh, inside the black hole once it becomes unstable? So, perfect question. Wow. So, the black hole is never going to become better, in other words, more gentle. It, if, it, it can only become worse. So, uh, um, we want to understand that, like, most of the time, black holes will remain black holes. It's just, as I said, instability means that, you know, you can have mass one, and then suddenly their mass increases by a lot, or their spin increases by a lot even though you just interacted a little bit with it. Um, um, <clears throat> so imagine, for example, a pencil sitting uh, just perpendicularly on the desk. That's a equilibrium. So it's, it's a pencil can sit like that, can be like that. But if you just move the pencil a little bit, just a tiny bit, then the pencil will fall. So that tells you that it completely changes its original uh, it, it, it deviates from its original position by a lot. It doesn't go back to its original state. Um, yeah, so what can happen is again, the, the, some characteristic quantities of black holes will change by a lot, but they will stay black holes. Or the worst that can happen is that you can form singularities. Namely, these quantities will in fact become infinite. And in that case, you might have, um, um, you know, strange things happening. Like again, physics, uh, as we know it, losing its uh, sense. So we would need other kind of theories to understand what's going on. But they would never become something uh, gentle, like to, to things would now be able to exit it. Right. Thank you. The question, the, the, like they get worse, but the question is how much worse they get. Something. Like <laughs> exactly. Well, Stefanos, I can say that not only are you an excellent researcher, you are a superb teacher being able to take us through from the very basics of geometry to black holes and instabilities. Fascinating talk. Thank you so much. I really do appreciate it. 
And I just want to turn it back now to Joshua to take us uh, to a close to the meeting. Thanks again, Stefanos. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you. And thank you, Professor Arakakis. And, and thanks again to everybody uh, for attending today. Um, I just want to provide a few links before we, we end things. Just here's a link to Professor Arakakis's website. There's a link to our UTSC Research YouTube channel, um, as well as our own uh, OBPRI website. So just a reminder, this, this uh, talk has been recorded, and uh, shortly we will put the recording up on this YouTube channel. Um, what we'll do is we'll distribute a link to this video uh, to everybody that registered for this event. Um, and just a reminder that uh, this is the last of the Research Excellence Speaker Series for, for this term, and we will return in the fall. Um, so yeah, thanks again for everybody for attending. Uh, have a good day. Thank you.